Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with this week in cannabis news from January 30th to February 5th. And now before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so you don't miss any future videos and then there's plenty of content for you to go back rewatch and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so, you, so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and then take advantage whenever you feel ready if you wish to do so. But we're going to start with this great news that we got out of Missouri from the Kansas City Star. And those in Missouri even are pleasantly surprised that cannabis sales are expected to start this Friday. With just one catch, the fact that they were caught off guard and are pleasantly surprised from my understanding. Missouri will allow the first dispensaries to begin selling cannabis for rec use on Friday. The Missouri Department of Health and Senior Service Services will be converting medical cannabis licenses to adult use licenses on Friday, but it's unclear when each dispensary will be approved. That's what we were told in this, but from my understanding, the idea was to convert. State officials said most medical cannabis dispensaries are in good standing, which most are, will see their licenses converted on Friday. So it seems like sales started officially in Missouri yesterday, which we love to see. They decided not to focus so much on social equity and just launch their market sooner than later so that those in the industry can build it from the ground up. Good job, Missouri. So we're seeing that start already. Um, and this is a link here I'll also put in the description as it probably an update from yesterday, um, but unfortunately I reached my free article limit, but there's more here on Missouri legalizing and all the details if you wanted to pause to read. And so with that, just wanted to share this one from Can Investments, a number of the MSOs that stand to benefit that have either retail or grow in Missouri. And so we got GTI, Verano, Cure Leaf, True Leaf, Columbia Care, Ascend Wellness, Goodness Growth, Terrasen, and Merrimed. Anyone else? Do let us know in the comments, but it's a good amount or decent list of MSOs that will benefit from that. And so with that, we also got news from Maryland. Uh, Maryland, in a moment, thanks for supporting. Now, Maryland is focusing a bit more on social equity like a lot of the states from the East Coast. For that reason, obviously, they're taking longer. Let's hope they don't have nearly as many hiccups as New Jersey or New York. But nonetheless, Maryland lawmakers unveil bill to launch cannabis sales months after voters approve legalization on the ballot. And so good news, the measure would get uh, the state prepared to regulate cannabis commerce as the state law legalizing possession of up to 1.5 ounces of cannabis for adults takes effect on July 1. So as of July 1, 2023, this goes into effect. Existing medical cannabis dispensaries would be converted into dual licenses at the same time that legalization takes effect on July 1 if they've paid a fee. And so any MSO or mom and pop shop already operating in there selling medical would be first in line to switch over and get access to rec, which is great. While regulators would need to start approving additional cannabis business licenses by July 1st, 2024. So in five months from now, we'll see already established operators in the state selling for medical be able to then start selling for rec and then any new uh, people will be able to start selling July 1st 2024 which is a year and five months away and so big opportunity there for the MSOs and anyone already in the state uh, to get a head start and so with that just wanted to share this update update from Natalie Fertig new in morning cannabis again take these with a grain of salt but just sharing of the news so don't shoot the messenger but a meeting held by Senate Schumer on Wednesday with other Dems floated putting forth a safe banking act hope and Graham's Act package uh, the deal that Republicans and Democrats agreed to in the last Congress as a new piece of legislation, obviously because they're probably receiving so much backlash for the fact that they haven't done anything that they need to start considering acting soon. And so again, take these with a grain of salt, but just wanted to share uh, what Nats is, is providing with us. And so you can pause to read, otherwise you can grab the full link below, but just wanted to share the irony. All this coming and, you know, at least I'm reporting on this. I feel good about that. And some news articles are catching up, but after repeatedly opposing cannabis bank reform, now Cory Booker says it is urgently needed. And it's just the, 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 the idiocracy, the, the, the hilarity, the hypocrisy. Senator Cory Booker says the dearth of financial services for state licensed cannabis businesses constitute a cannabis crisis that Congress must address as soon as possible. This is the same Senator who, together with Senate Majority Leader Schmuck Schumer, blocked cannabis banking in 2021 when Booker promised he would do everything he can to prevent its approval so that small businesses, social equity entrepreneurs, and mom and pop shops couldn't get banking loans and unfortunately are going to get driven out of the industry thanks to these schmucks. So on top of that though, just happy to share the, the real growth happening in some of these states as well. From February 3rd, chicagobusiness.com is Illinois weed sales picked up in January as rec sales rose 9% in January from a year earlier, January 2022, to $127.9 million according to the IDF. PR. That's the strongest year-over-year -year growth since June when cannabis sales increased 10%. And so the number l likely reflects the opening of a handful of new dispensaries as part of the 192 retail licenses that were awarded last year. And while they were awarded, they were delayed up until this year. And while I haven't seen any update on any of them actually opening, I will provide one as soon as possible. Although this is added, this is the first time I'm seeing this. But main thing just to highlight, you can pause to read the rest, but overall the state's cannabis sales were off 11% from December, which hit I think 143 million, but we know December is the biggest month to end the year off. Uh, which 
which is typically the strongest month of the year for cannabis sales. And so if we compare to December, 143.8 went down to 127.9. But what they are, you know, happy about is the growth, 127.9 up from 117 million last year at the same time, with essentially the same number of stores or maybe a handful from any new. And obviously, the sooner that they can approve and open these shops and get them online, the sooner we can see more sales growth driven through Illinois' legal market. And so with that, just wanted to share an update from Michigan. While I've shared this in the past, uh, it does highlight the good and the bad that's really happening with this complicated industry at this time. Todd Harrison shares Michigan's Cannabis Regulatory Agency reports record high sales as they managed to hit 221 combined for adult use and medical sales in December, which we love to see. And Forbes is sharing the story, and Forbes is a more mainstream outlet that more people might get access to. But while it's highlighting the record high sales because people want to vote for cannabis with their dollars, it's also highlighting the reality of what happens when the Senate Dems don't do their job. They don't pass the Safe Banking Act to get the cash off the streets and essentially work for people that are lobbying for them to keep the status quo alive. And so while that's the sad reality, just again sharing that record high sales are coming with robberies, um, and that's why we need some sort of policy to get the cash off the street and make America a lot safer if only it was sitting around in the Senate or it passed the House seven times already. So with that, just wanted to share this take I found this morning from Richard Herb 13 because it really just encapsulates how much of a clown world that we've been living in over the last few years. And obviously, if you can remove the emotions from it and sort of look clearly at all the complicated factors, unfortunately, you start to see patterns and you realize that the deception can run really deep. And because Fi apparently this is true, Pfizer earned more than $100 billion last year. And so this is coming from Jimmy Dore, who's a great based source, but this is CNBC. The COVID pandemic drives Pfizer's 2022 revenue to a record of $100 billion. Absolutely disgusting. And so Daniel highlights Pfizer earned more than 100 billion last year, more than half of that was from this certain type of drugs as opposed to just staying healthy, getting sleep, and you know taking care of your immune system. The pandemic was nothing. I'm just going to let you read this because saying it out loud could get my channel flagged. Well, I don't think anyone in the right mind wants this to be the case because obviously it's straight criminal and a massive conflict of interest. It's also true that the proposed solution to the pandemic was paid for with taxpayer dollars. And for example, the delusional PM of Canada paid for 10 doses per person. And so is he working for the best interest of Canadians, especially when we knew since February 2021 that the fraudulent, that the data from the trials might have been fraudulent. So again, is he working in the best interest of the Canadian people or is he working for some other multinational corporation that you know, gives him some incentive to buy 10 doses per taxpayer. Absolutely insane. With our dollars. Furiating. Anyways, I trust that these clown times that we're living in too will pass and that we will see some justice, although it might take some time. But let this be a friendly reminder that anytime the government says something is in the best interest of the public health, it is not. If it was, they'd be promoting exercise, eating well, and sleeping eight hours plus a night. They don't because if they can convince you that they know more about your health than you do, and keep you coming back to them, they have a patient for life. And while we've seen this, unfortunately, in the past, I think it was the 2000s, big oil sort of took over and, you know, contaminated politics with a lot of their money. Then we saw big tech do that. And with hindsight, it's a lot clearer that through some evil and deceitful planning, it looks like Big Pharma was trying to do the exact same thing to start this decade. And so all I can say is thank you, Project Veritas, for the work that you do. Thank you, Thai Royal Family, for speaking up about the injury that your family suffered because you can only censor for so long and eventually the truth comes out as the chickens do come home to roost. And so back to cannabis. Toby Cannabis, thank you for sharing this visual. The large to mid cap MSOs have growth market share from 10% to 28% since 2019. Obviously, MA being a big contributor to that. Uh, but share gains likely continue in the current environment. However, of course, going forward, the real focus should be on profitable share going forward. And so, if we look at uh, light blue, shows the large cap MSOs, dark blue shows the mid cap MSOs, yellow or gold shows the small cap ones, and then gray is the other public and private operators. We can clearly see that at least sales overall 2019 sales, 12.2 billion. 2020 sales, 18 billion. We saw massive growth year over year there. 2021 sales, less growth because more restrictions and, you know, less friendly uh, policy being passed for the industry. 2021 totals, 25.1 billion. And then again, this was the worst year that we've just gone through. Tomated totals, 27.1 billion. Still a little bit of growth up year over year. Um, not as much as we've seen in the past, just because we've had very little go our way in terms of making the industry or helping the industry grow or thrive. Regardless, the main takeaway is you can see the large cap MSOs are increasing their market share the most from 7.3% in 2019 to 19.7% in 2022, based on the estimates still, while other public and private operators have gone down from 84.6% to 69.3%. And if we look at small caps, these are the mom and pop shops, the social equity entrepreneurs, their market share is actually going down because they can't get safe, therefore they can't bank, therefore they cannot compete. Hence, why tier one and operators seem to be the way to go. And so with that, Jesse Redmond sharing, again, that's not advice, just my opinion. Uh, Cowan lowering expectations ahead of Q4 earnings. And so you can pause to read all of what Cowan has to say, but of course, take these with a grain of salt because they're often wrong. But main takeaway for me was for 2027, their new $40.6 billion total addressable market as an adjustment representing a 10% reduction to previously published estimates, largely because they're removing Pennsylvania as an adult use market that would have been ready for 2024 or 2023 and help driven sales that way. And so more if you wanted to pause to read. Otherwise, this one from Emma Beck, 
Beckerly wanted to share total cannabis retail licenses by state. Well, she says dispensary. Uh, they seem to have gotten the count wrong because down here looks like there may be double counting of dispensaries that have both medical and adult use licenses. Nevada has only 101 active dispensary licenses, not 172. So it's more accurate to just say that this measures the number of retail licenses in each state, but it doesn't decide for between adult use and medical. So that's worth knowing, uh, but it's just an interesting visual that I wanted to at least share. So thank you, Emma, uh, from Canna Curio. So again, take this with a grain of salt since they couldn't really make that discrepancy before publishing it. Um, but we can just see the number of states that have the most retail licenses, providing the most opportunity to as many people as possible to join the industry versus, you know, the ones that have the least amount of retail licenses. So another interesting way to take in the information from each market, nonetheless. And so with that, I wanted to share this one from Seeking Alpha on Green Thumb Industries, best of breed in U.S. cannabis. And so again, this is not advice, just sharing what was written by Cannabis Growth Investor. And while Green Thumb has been the most profitable, um, producing cash flow or positive cash flow from operations, I think in each quarter in the last few years, um, unfortunately, I cannot read the whole thing, but you should be able to if you don't visit Seeking Alpha too often. So link will be below if you're interested and wanted to read and learn more about Green Thumb Industries. Um, while we got this one from Joe Greisler, thank you, Joe, for sharing. This Florida Recreational Cannabis Amendment clears the first hurdle. Uh, True Leaf has submitted 294,037 valid petition signatures. At least 222,898 signatures are required for the court to review the proposed wording of the measure, a key legal step in the progress. So love to see Florida clearing its first hurdle. Uh, many more to go, but uh, you got to do what they got to do now in order to prepare for 2024. And with that coming from the Office of Medical Cannabis Use, looking at this past week, uh, new dispensaries were opened from January 30th to the 3rd. We just have one from Green Dragon in Pensacola. Well, if we look at the qualified patient count for this past week, we can see the number went up to 788,752, which actually only represents 555 patients added week over week. And so while that is very low compared to what we're used to seeing, um, over 1,000 or 2,000, we'll just have to wait to see if that's a trend that carries over from next week. I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, if you happen to live in Florida and have any input, let me know. But with that dispensary dispensations from January 27th to February 2nd, we can see all the MSOs in the state, the number of dispensaries that they have approved in an operation, and the number of milligrams of THC sold from this past week, and the number of milligrams of CBD sold, and ounces in smokable flour. And so this is the breakdown. But of course, we've got Pierre Gilles providing us with the Florida THC market share comp sheet, top eight market share for uh, THC, number of THC sold, True Leaf, Air Cannabis Dispensary, Cure Leaf, MUV, and Sertera leading the way with a few behind here. Um, but then also, I didn't realize, and so this is again my bad if I never made the distinction, but it seems like he makes one for the THC and for the flower. And so my bad if I never distinguish between the two, but the second one, Florida Flower Market Share Comp Sheet Top 8. And this is the one where Air Wellness is not second. So that's where it makes more sense to me now. My bad. Um, but True Leave number one in terms of... Um, ounces of smokable flour, cure leaf number two, move number three, air cannabis dispensary number four, and then Sertera wellness again number five. And we've got a few more uh, other dispensaries doing well down here. But just wanted to share that. Otherwise, links will be below. And so with that, some news out of New York because we have to. Uh, got to laugh at something. MJ Stock Trader shares in the half mile between the cities, only two authorized cannabis retail operations, Housing Works Cannabis Co. and Smacked. 20 other shops are open for business and they're gray market shops, of course, benefiting on the fact that if they get caught, they get like a $250 fine. So why not make thousands of dollars and pay two 50 a day if that's all you're going to end up going through. And so more on this if you wanted to read about how much of a joke New York is. We don't want to spend too much time on that. And just highlighting further, a lawsuit continues to prevent cannabis dispensaries from opening in the Rochester region. So again, more hiccups, uh, possibly the worst rollout we could have imagined for New York. Obviously, it can get better over time once we get through these growing pains, but just highlighting the, the lunacy more down here if you wanted to read about what's blocking this progress in Rochester. And so while that seems to be the case, I wanted to share this one from Todd Harrison, who highlights what the CEO of Scott's Miracle Grow says. Now, again, he's a CEO of Scott's Miracle Grow. Clearly, he probably has some experience and has a good knowledge of markets um, and, and how things fluctuate and change over time, but this is coming from him, not me. New York has tripped over itself in developing and implementing rules, which has prevented the market from reaching its near-term potential. But let me make this clear. New York will become a monster market and we will see it through. Fair enough. I hope you're right. But how long is this going to take? Let me know in the comments when we might see New York finally uh, turn it around and pick things up. And so unfortunately with that, we did get uh, the Georgia Commission rescinding the rules to sell and produce medical cannabis that they announced last week. And so while this would have been great news, um, unfortunately, it seems like they're backtracking taking a step backwards due to a technicality. Which, well, we hate to see them backtrack on last week's unanimous approval to pass the rules and get the ball rolling. Apparently changes are being made and those changes along with new meeting notices will be posted on Monday. So maybe Wednesday I can share when they hope to have the new meeting and rules approval 
approval. Uh, but last Thursday, a vote if certified would have cleared the way for low THC dispensaries to open as soon as the spring. However, officials have not specifically said when the distribution will begin. And so more hiccups out of Georgia, but hopefully sooner than later, we'll get past these growing pains and then they can launch so that people have a safer, non-addictive medicinal alternative. And so with that, a few more stories. Tom Angle, thank you for sharing. Today, as of February 2nd, so two days ago, Thursday, the Minnesota House uh, Agriculture Finance Minnesota House House Agriculture Finance and Policy Committee became the sixth in the chamber to approve a cannabis legalization bill with six more still left to go. So six down, six more to go. More on the full story if you wanted to read about more of the details. Well, thank you, Todd, for sharing this one. Oklahoma could generate nearly half a billion in cannabis tax dollars over five years if voters approve legalization next month, analysis shows. No doubt they can, and no doubt Oklahoma voters will likely vote yes on March 7th when they have the ballot presented to them. So more on this story, um, but we will keep tabs on this and we'll present that next month. Because I wouldn't be surprised to see Oklahoma approve and launch their market even before Maryland's legalization bill goes into effect on July 1st. And so with that, Todd Harrison, thanks for sharing this one. A feel-good story is California federal judge orders release of medical pot operator. And so success as someone gets their life back and is no longer criminalized for something they shouldn't have been criminalized in the first place. So thank you, Weldon Angeles, for the work you're doing. Hopefully you're building momentum for something bigger at the uh, the federal level that might pleasantly surprise us, but U.S. District Judge Dale A. Drozd wrote changes in the legal landscape, among other factors, supported a reduced sentence. So again, just love to see people getting their lives back. More on the link below if you wanted to read in the description. While apparently Yale School of Medicine to establish Yale Center for the Science of Cannabis and Cannabinoids. So while a lot of these schools are becoming contaminated with the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion ideology. As long as that stays out, I don't see this being a bad thing at all. And so more to pause and read if you wanted to learn about what Yale and School of Medicine plans to do. So with that, a few studies before we go. TNFonline.com, UK Medical Cannabis Registry shares the assessment of clinical outcomes in patients with headache disorders. What are headache disorders? Nonetheless, growing evidence supports the use of cannabis-based medicinal products for chronic pain. Um, and the study aims to assess changes in validated patient-reported outcome measures in patients with headaches prescribed cannabis and investigate the clinical safety. And so what did these brief conclusions, what did the results and conclusions find? Uh, improvements in headache migraine-specific patient-reported outcome measures and general health-related quality of life were associated with the initiation of cannabis in patients with headache disorders. And so general health-related quality of life, and so it seems like they weren't as disabled by their headache disorders um, if they're using cannabis than if they did not have cannabis to possibly treat that. That's what I'm getting out of this. Did you get anything different? Let me know in the comments. But again, more reason why we ought to deschedule sooner than later. And so this is a study that I think I might have already featured or for the first time marijuana, marijuana moment is picking up. But long-term medical cannabis use tied to reduced opioid dos dosages. We know this, but this is again coming from American Medical Association. And so if it's coming from the AMA, then people ought to take it more seriously, you think, obviously. But um, nonetheless, new study led by researchers at New York's De Department of Health and published this week uh, by the AMA found that chronic pain patients who received medical cannabis for longer than a month saw significant reductions in prescribed opioids. Patients' daily opioid doses, dosages were reduced by 47% to 51% of the baseline dosages after eight months. And so those are massive findings, again, highlighting why Big Pharma is terrified of cannabis becoming legal because it'll eat into at least 30%, now maybe 40 to 50% of their profits. And so, sorry, I suggest you can pause to read, um, and then there's definitely more info you can pause to read. Otherwise, you can grab the whole link below if this one's new to you and you wanted to read through it. But lastly, just wanted to share this story out of Ireland, just again, highlighting how the plant gets demonized, unfortunately, and why descheduling is the best thing we can do to try and help normalize it in the meantime. And we keep fighting for it, but cancer sufferer tells judge she cannot stop using cannabis because she gets sick. So imagine that. Stacey Harcourt uh, told Gardai that she had undergone chemotherapy, but it hadn't worked, and that cannabis is the only thing that works. And one thing I just found very infuriating in this uh, in this write-up was Judge Martina Baxter adjourned the case to allow time for probation service assessment. She said she wanted urine analysis for drugs. Mr. Kalanen, who I believe is, is the lawyer for this woman, said that over the last 10 years his client had become attached to using the herb to treat the cancer. People that are you know addicted to opioids that they've become attached to the medicine used to treat their cancer or attached to their treatment used that you'd only use this word attached because it's the connotation of cannabis, trying to make it look like it's a negative thing, right? As opposed to a positive thing that you can use as a medicine, couple out like every few hours every day, and it'll treat just like you were using some sort of pills. And it's just absolutely infuriating. But Harcourt told the judge that she would try to cut down on her use of the drug, but said, I ultimately cannot stop completely. I tried before and I gave it up and I got very sick, she said. It's not an addiction. And that she'd never done any drugs before and only discovered cannabis after her cancer diagnosis. And so again, seems like for her, cannabis changes the perspective of the pain in her brain and makes it bearable to live with. 
Yet, for whatever reason, those following the law cannot see the light in that. Judge Baxter told the defendant she appreciated her situation, but in the eyes of the law, you were still committing an offense. Every time she used the drug, she ordered that any medical reports be forwarded to the Prohibition Service as part of the assessment and adjourned sentence uh, to April 21 next. So again, just highlighting the bullshit you have to go through in countries where cannabis is still illegal and you can't get access to the one thing that allows you to live your life normally because it's still continuously demonized. And so again, descheduling is the way we keep fighting for it. But that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. And I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please just leave, leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos, and I'll catch you on Wednesday for a midweek update. Have a great week, everybody.